Hello, my name is Lowell, pronouns he, him, and this is the first of a two-shot of Dreams and Machines. This is the new starter set that has just come out from Modifius. It is out for free as a PDF, uh, and then they also have a nice box set you can pre-order for it. I've run uh, quite a bit of 2D20, and so I was very interested in this, uh, especially because it is inspired with a capital I-N uh, uh, by Horizon Zero Dawn. Uh, it, it very much looks like Horizon Zero Dawn. It, it has that that uh, sort of aesthetic. We've got uh, this place where we've got these different peoples that have kind of fallen post-apocalyptic, and then we've got these machines moving around that are great and lumbering and, and dangerous. So it very much has that look uh, of that. And... I'm excited about that. I think that's a, a a great setting, and I'm I'm curious to see what it's going to look like. The starter set is surprisingly deep. Uh, there is a lot of material. I'm just doing a two shot, kind of based on the tutorial setup, but like it's very clear you could play a campaign with it. It sets up a, a, an extended adventure. It's got lots of arts and images and things like that. So. Uh, today we're going to be doing uh, the basic setup, our characters, we're going to be playing out some scenes and so on, but uh, before I go too much further, let me go through our cats document, which kind of sets up what we're doing today. Uh, so this is the, the concept. This is not Earth. This is a colony world of Earth called uh, Avera Prime. I don't think that kind of matters in some ways. You can imagine it as Earth. Basically, at some point in the near past, they were cut off from Earth. And uh, this sort of developed technological colony world uh, ended up in a war with a corrupted AI called the Builder. And... The builder used these great machines, uh, which have now come to be called wakers, that uh, devastated society. The, the AI was defeated, but society had collapsed. Uh, and so we've got this kind of fallen tech world where there are these dangerous machines and machine beasts that are out there. And we have our peoples using a mix of old world uh, more archaic uh, society ways, along with some tech that they've been able to find, salvage, and and repurpose. Uh, so that's that is very much the the basic. So again, very much Horizon uh, uh, Zero Dawn. Uh, uh, this is a place of kind of wonders and exploration with these dangerous things that are out there and kind of a, a looming threat that these machines might wake up or that people might try to you know restore the builder or or things like that so that's kind of the big overarching plot uh and so today in terms of concept this is very much kind of, uh, uh, like we're going to wander through the setting for a couple of sessions to see what we can see and to, to to learn the rules uh so with the approach this is a starter set uh, we are going to be doing character building today. Character building involves choosing a, a sort of origin from one of five origin types uh, and then a role within that origin and the combination of those two things and a few other picks kind of builds the character. It's kind of a quick pick thing, but there's still some choices to be made. Uh, we're going to be doing that, getting that set up. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about like how your characters will know what, one another, figure out your connections, and then we'll be hard framing into the the scenario. This is a tutorial uh, scenario, so we will be kind of hard framing in. There'll be some incidents that are kind of set up to, to test out some of the rules. Uh, the booklet has us introducing certain modules of the rules at certain times, uh, and so I'll try to go through those as we, we do that. It does open up. Uh, at a certain point, 
Uh, I expect that today we'll probably get through those couple of incidents and maybe get to a position where next time we can open it up and have a little more choice about where our characters go, what they interact with, what they do. This is also about teaching 2D20, learning those rules. And uh, after I, I get done with the, the the cats, I'll talk a little bit about the basics that you should, should know of that. Uh, in terms of tone, uh, this is a, a th game that is about survival and wonder. Uh, it is dangerous, but it's also like a place with all kinds of weird, wild things in it, which which is the thing that makes me most excited here. Uh, so it's not grim. Uh, uh, it is it is tough potentially, but uh, this is not a, a, a grim, dark uh, setting, and definitely. I want us to imagine the aesthetics and visuals of, of Horizon or other similar uh, sort of uh, uh, fallen tech worlds. Uh, in terms of that, having that set out sort of as, as a, a baseline for our characters who are heroic in the face of this difficult world, uh, I want to talk briefly about safety. So our safety tools are layered meaning that they build on one another. This cats is kind of the baseline of that. We are using uh, also lines and veils, and you'll see that on the safety tab in the character keeper. So lines are hard lines on things that we do not want to be seeing in play. Uh, uh, veils being anything that if it were to occur in play, we would fade to black on it, or we would talk about it off screen, or we would elide away from it. Uh, and then also uh, ask first, meaning that if there's something that you're okay probably with playing with it, but you'd also want us to check in definitively before that particular topic. Common ones that are marked with ask first are PC betrayal, mind control. These are, are things if they haven't already been hit by a line uh, or a veil. Uh, so uh, kind of after we get through character creation, before we go to introductions, uh, I'll stop and I'll go through what everyone has chosen. So this is kind of, you have some time during this process to make your choices about those things. This is a living document. So things can get added to it. Uh, as we go along, we'll check in and see if anything has been uh, uh, brought in uh, between this session and next session. The second tool that's kind of related to lines and veils is the X card. And the X card is marked with, you know, uh, either this gesture or saying X card. X card you use to mark out material that you find uh, objectionable, that you find problematic, that you find triggering, that you find wildly off tone from what we've established. We use the X card to mark out material that is problematic. Uh, and if you do that, you do not have to explain your decision. Uh, the only thing we might ask is like where we need to cut back to. You are welcome to explain in that decision, but you're not obligated to. So never feel that you have to defend your use of a safety tool. It's very important to me. Uh, if we perhaps get at a point where maybe we've started to move towards a line or a veil and we haven't caught it, that's another good place to use the X card. It's a place to help us recalibrate. In that case, the X card is kind of a pause card for us to stop, recalibrate where we're at. Uh, the X card is something that if something happens in the first couple of times, you're okay with it, but then you're not later, then you should always feel free to continue to, to like use that X card to come back to it. You've never passed up the opportunity to do that. Uh, the other thing that I want to say is the X card is also for calibrating if uh, someone's play is perhaps intrusive uh, uh, or uh, is stepping over you or or you feel is is maybe needs to be recalibrated. That's a point to do the X card, uh, especially with those kinds of things. If you're finding that you're having that kind of issue with a player, you can also message me in the chat as a GM. Uh, and you can do that privately and just so to alert me if I haven't caught that that's happening and I can kind of stop and I'll try and, and calibrate uh, as best I can on that. Uh, the last 
well, not the last, but the second to last one we have is our open door policy, which means that if you need to step away for whatever reason, emotional, physical, someone's at the door, uh, you should feel free to do that. That means that uh, you can just go. Uh, if you're going to be back or if you're not going to be back, it, you're welcome to tell us that, but you're not under an obligation to do that. Uh, it also means that if we get to the end of the session and between this session and next one, you're like, that is not the game for me. That's not the game I thought it was going to be. That's not the game I'm enjoying. Uh, you don't have to come back. Uh, you don't have to explain yourself. You can just uh, email and say, hey, I don't think I'm, I'm uh, going to come back for the second session. That is absolutely fair. You should never stick around and play in a game that you're not enjoying. That's a really important to me. I am too old for that, for, for my players to do that, or for me to stay in a game that I'm not enjoying. So I that's 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 important. Uh, the last thing that we have is kind of a, a tangential safety tool is we do have a romance matrix here for if your characters would be interested in romance with NPCs, with PCs, or asking first. This is just kind of a courtesy. I don't know how much of that we will have in the course of this play, but I want to have that out there for people so that uh, people are aware of that. Uh, uh, you can have you know, mark mark positives on things and you know or negatives, and and have the ask first to 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 check in uh, on that. Uh, our structure today. I usually take breaks on the hour. That's my my goal. I usually take a 10 and then a five. Uh, and we'll play until we get to a good stopping point, like a point that feels like a good break point for what we're doing. All right, now I'm going to take a deep slug of coffee. And before I get too much further, before we do character creation, I want to talk about how this game of 2D20 operates. So you will have with your character uh, an attribute, which is a high, a fairly high number, and a skill, which is a lower number. Uh, basically, when you go to do a test, you will roll 2d20, and each roll that is below that attribute, uh, meet, meets that attribute or below, uh, will count as a success. And if it so happens that your roll uh, is below the associated skill, that counts as two successes. So uh, we'll count up successes. Difficulties for things are usually ones or twos. You want to meet or beat that uh, value. So it's a pretty simple 2d20. We check how many successes you get. We compare it to the difficulty number. That's the basics of this. There are going to be a couple of currencies that are going to come into play. There's your effectively hit points, which is called spirit. Uh, you can spend spirit to keep yourself from getting taken out by damage. In this way, it's a little bit like fate. Uh, but you can also spend spirit to give yourself another d20 when you go to roll. The other currency that's in play that we'll get to a, a little bit later is called momentum. Basically, if you get more successes than you needed for a particular role, that becomes momentum that goes into a pool that can be spent on extra effects. Uh, the other thing that makes this a little bit like fate, if you've played that, is this has the concept of, of truths. Truths are basically things that you can establish with a test uh, or are already established in the setting that either provide fictional positioning to allow you to do something or often to make it easier or more difficult to do something, meaning you might need another success to actually succeed or might need fewer successes. Uh, but we'll come back to that in terms of how the resolution works uh, a little bit later. So let me talk about our character creation process. Uh, we'll go to the uh, character sheet here uh, over in the pool. If I had had my wits about me, I would have colored each of those columns differently, but I did not. I just cut it and paste. So feel free to change colors uh, as you need to. Here is what we're going to be doing is we're going to be making our character picks from our origins 
and our archetypes. So uh, in a moment, I'll have you pick your columns if you haven't already. And then I want to uh, flip to the character picks thing. Uh, so there is a uh, the character picks tab, uh, a set of choices. You're going to choose an origin. And that origin is going to give you uh, stats for your might, your quickness, your insight, your resolve, and your tech. And it's going to give you uh, some extra points towards your spirit, which starts at zero, and some extra points towards your supply. Uh, the origins are the Everin. The Everin is the uh, farmer type. The gatherer type, these are the characters that are very much focused on uh, their homesteads and agriculture, and uh, they're in more settled societies that uh, have built up and focused on that. Uh, dreamers are another people. They are more focused on the spiritual side of things and rejecting technology, turning away from technology as much as they can to focus on the spiritual side. They can use some tech, but they tend to shun it a little more than other uh, of the, the different peoples that are in this world. Archivists are the peoples who have focused on recovering old ways, old tech, and integrating those into their lives. They have a slightly higher tech to their societies uh, and groups. Uh, spears are the more militant uh, peoples. These are hunter peoples that uh, uh, might be potentially nomadic, might be traveling, uh, that uh, have a little more forceful drive to their uh, uh, groupings. And then the lastly, the river. Uh, these are the people that uh, have generally used the rivers to incorporate trade, to move up and down the rivers, to contact different communities and colonies. They are about that kind of communication, mercantile uh, operations, and, and so on. So those are the origins. What you'll notice is that when you pick your origin and you get that stuff, it says that you have a choice of two different archetypes, uh, meaning that this will be the kind of the, the role that your character does. So at, at risk of going on too much, I want to briefly go through what, what those are. Uh, gatherer, obviously uh, your character is focused on uh, sort of a, a daily survival, uh, domestication, life, th those kinds of things. Guardians are characters that are about defending others, defending their communities, uh, defending people, defending their homesteads, those kinds of things. Mediators are people that are, are merchants, talkers, diplomats uh, about social interactions. Techs are people who, who work with tech, are willing to uh, engage with those. They might have studied some of the, the glyphs, which are signs that... Uh, these machines can sometimes read that are almost like spell invocations that you put on something and it affects the ma machines. And then grabbers are scavengers. So those are the, the five archetypes. These origins kind of generally describe the community that you were raised in. It doesn't mean that uh, your community wasn't in contact with other ones. And in fact, a, a settlement might be made up of several different origins and even variants of the, the same community. But this kind of generally describes uh, what that that is. Uh, so I'm going to come around. You can take the same origin. I would prefer that people take different uh, archetypes just for the to, to kind of vary things up. Uh, but I'll kind of do this in in order of, of of arrival. Uh, Robbie, are there any of those origins that are appealing to you? Um, I guess uh, on first glance, maybe the Everin okay. origin. All right. Mark that down. 
Uh, Mads? I was thinking of either the Dreamer or the Spear. Um... Hmm. Let me well, do... hang on to that. I'll come and check with everyone else, okay. and then I'll come back to you. Okay, great. Uh, so get that. Uh, Pocket, what about for you? I was looking at either Everin, Archivist, or Dreamer. Everin. Okay, so uh, Robbie's kind of grabbed Everin. So Archivist or Dreamer? Can I can I narrow it down for you on that? Works for me. Okay. And then Daniel. Um, I was kind of looking at uh, Archivist or Spear. Archivist or Spear. So, Mads, I come back to you. <laughs> but between Dream and Spear, which one appeals to you? Uh, you know what? Let me go ahead and do Spear then. Okay. Pocket, are you okay with Dreamer then? Totally. Okay. And Daniel, let's have you do Archivist. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, so go ahead and uh, uh, choose your origin, record stats, and then go ahead and pick your archetype. Um, uh, I, I guess, let me, let me ask, I guess I probably should check through and see what people are thinking. Robbie, do you know from between gatherer and guardian, which one you might want to do? Um, I mean, I, either one is, either one is fine. Um, I mean, I guess, I guess if I was going to be completely farmer, um, uh, well, I don't know. I maybe the gatherer might be slightly yeah. more appealing for me. Yeah. Okay. Let's have you. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mads, what are you thinking between uh, guardian and grabber? Um, is it as important to have different archetypes as different origins? I don't think so. I don't think it. Uh, 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 I think it is possible to have more people take uh, those. Okay. Um, I'm going to opt for Guardian. Okay. Uh, Pocket, what about for you between Mediator and Guardian? Mediator. Okay. Uh, and for Archivist, Tech or Mediator? Uh, let's keep it all different. I'll do Tech. Okay. All right. Uh, so let me have you go through and, and, and walk through, choose your origin, record those stats, your archetype. You'll pick a temperament uh, that you uh, go through and then uh, when you are all set with those things, uh, you are going to get uh, two talents based on your archetype. And there is a tab for those talents there. Uh, so you can uh, pick uh, two of those. So now I'm going to be quiet for a few minutes and let you all do that and look at the talents and make your picks and so on. Oh, I'm sorry, one talent. I apologize. Is when we make that decision very difficult. And some of the things you'll get from your archetype and your origin uh, are equipment. And when we go through, I'll talk about and kind of give you some of the, the stats on what some of those things are.
Hey, Lowell. There is a section <clears throat> on here for spirit. Uh -huh. uh, it looks like one may be a tracker of some kind and one is a attribute. Yeah. Uh, so the attribute sort of tracks what your like default, like standard spirit uh, rating is. Spirit gets spent as a currency. So the tracker there off to the right hand side will kind of show where it fluctuates uh, up and down. Okay, so the so our attribute we just sum up the pluses for both the origin and the archetype. Is that right? That is correct. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Lo, where do we record the um, temperament? So for the temperament, uh, what you'll be recording is uh, the spirit gain, uh, which is the, the thing sort of below the all caps, uh, and then the exhaustion.
And, and we pick one of the talents? Yes. Thank you for everybody another few minutes and then we'll we'll kind of uh go around and talk with her about who the characters are.
So I will tell everyone, if you see me looking down, I have printed out this on a most bunch of this stuff on paper and bound it in a notebook because I am old and have a hard time working with PDFs. So uh, I have I have done that for my own own reference. So you may see me doing that more often than I usually do. Uh, let's go around and we're going to have everybody introduce themselves, kind of what they're thinking about in terms of how they're imagining their character, what they look like and, and those kinds of things. And, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of do a little bit of letting you also give us a flavor of, of what kind of place you think you come from or what kind of uh, uh, shapes your, your people's origins and things like that. One of the things I'd like you to think about is uh, just because for nice color is like, what's a like trinket that you have like a, 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 a either you know valuable piece of jewelry or like something from the old world or something like that in that kind of classic uh, fashion. So we'll, we'll have you think about that. Uh, let me briefly go through right now what we have as our safety tools, as our established lines and veils, just so everybody is on the same page. Uh, so I'm going to start with one that I put on there. I just want to, uh, as it start kind of start at the bottom. Uh, one thing I wanted to avoid is the terms tribes or tribal or savages or anything like that. Uh, those are loaded terms. So we want to avoid those, uh, talk about peoples, uh, communities, life ways, all of those kinds of things. Uh, so that's just, uh, one thing to keep in mind. Uh, other lines that we have are for graphic gore, a harm to animals, harm to children, homophobia, racism, sexual assault, torture by the PCs, transphobia, and graphic descriptions of blunt force head trauma. So those are all there on the table uh, uh, being sort of put off to the side. We're not going to be dealing with those topics. Uh, and we have a veil on sexual content, meaning that if there were to be something like that, we would fade to black when that would occur. So those are all things that we have on there. And again, uh, if we need to add to that, or if we hit something, you realize you need to X card and you need to add it to the line or avail, that's something that we can do in play. Uh, so Robbie, you are in the first column. Uh, and so I would have you go first and tell us about uh, what you're imagining for your character. All right, so uh, my character's name is Lazarus or Laz, uh, an Eberron gatherer uh, archetype. Uh, I think uh, Lazarus, um, as their their kind of token, carries usually around their neck has tied some item. And I don't think anybody really is quite aware of, I mean, it, it seems like it maybe was a toy. I mean, it's it's this spinning device that, you know, he kind of plays with and, it, you know, it kind of has, you know, a, a kind of part of it that he can kind of spin and it's very shiny, the kind of strange metal that uh, kind of really glistens. Um, I mean, maybe it was a toy or maybe it was part of some machine, but, you know, and had some real, you know, kind of utility function. But whatever it is, I mean, Laz just uses it as, a, you know, as something, you know, he carries with him. And when he really starts to think he'll he'll like sometimes spin that little device, you know, um, uh, I don't have a picture yet for uh, maybe during our break. I will, sure. I will try to find. Uh, are Are you imagining them younger? Uh, yeah, more middle. Okay, so younger. I think younger, and I think small and slight, but clearly athletic and capable. Um, you know, so the you know slight, but but I don't think anybody would look at Lazarus and think weak. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that they would, you know, think this is somebody who is a survivor and who is fit. Uh, and let's let's look through uh, the items. So you have an origin bonus, which is the glyph pattern clothing, uh, which is clothing that has these markers, these patterns on them that 
fool machines uh, that essentially uh, they add a difficulty to if a machine comes after you kind of uh, bonds. What do you imagine these glyphs look like? Are we talking like QR codes? Are we talking some kind of strange patterns? Are we talking mathematical symbols? What are you imagining for the glyphs that, and it may be different from person to person, but that 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 Lazarus has on their clothing? I, I think it kind of looks like um, wiring. Like there's a kind of strange wiring that's almost like a thread, except it it kind of goes through the fabric and you can kind of see, and it does, and it, seems to not be kind of regular in terms of the way it's threaded through, but, you know, you kind of look at it as it's this kind of strange metallic looking thread. And mm -hmm. I, I, Lazarus thinks that, that, you know, he's, he's realized that it has this effect on the machines. And he thinks that, that, you know, may, maybe there's something electrical or something that's actually coursing through this, uh, fabric with that kind of threaded fine wire that kind of uh, emits something that makes him less noticeable. Okay, okay. Uh, I like the idea of it kind of being a little bit like like samite, the the silver thread run through clothing. There, that that's a, a very cool idea. Uh, your talent you took understand the land. Uh, so when you succeed at a skill test to search for resources or valuables, you get to ask a question. So it's a free question. Uh, one of the things you can do with this this game when you when you make tests, you can, uh, if you have extra momentum and stuff, you can uh, quote unquote obtain information, which is essentially asking a question like in in a PBTA. Uh, so you have a better sense of of those kinds of resources and spotting them and being able to find them. Uh, and then, what did you take as your temperament? Uh, my temperament is demonstrative. Okay. What do you think that means? Well, I I feel like um, just in terms of, of their physical appearance, Lazarus feels like, you know, he doesn't really have anything that makes him stick out, you know, physically. Mm -hmm. um, so when, when he does accomplish something he wants to make sure that people are taking note uh right taking note of what it is that he actually is able to accomplish so that people don't people learn not to underestimate him or at least he wants to think that absolutely absolutely uh and then uh so you're going to regain spirit one of the ways you can do it is whenever you make a skill test of difficulty three or higher, you're going to regain one. That means if the difficulty is three and you roll three successes, then you'll get that that spirit. Uh, and then uh, your exhaustion means that if you've spent down through your spirit to resist injuries or whatever, if you hit zero, uh, your particular kind of exhaustion means that, that you're confused, you fail insight tests, uh, and so on. So... Uh, the other thing is you have for gear, you have a hunting pulser and heavy protective clothing. And I have actually the stats for those on the equipment tab. You should feel yeah. free if you want to copy those those over. Uh, when something says like damage three or damage two, that's basically how much damage it's going to do unless you've rolled more successes and you spend those to do more, more damage. Uh, there are certain effects that'll go on, but I'm, we're not going to worry about those. We'll come to those as as we need to. Uh, all right. I think that gives us a good sense of, of who you are. Uh, one of the things we will be doing once we've got everybody introduced is we'll kind of like be figuring out like how you know each other, what, what the connections are. I, I always like to have those in play. Uh, Puckett, uh, tell us about who your character is. I'm playing a character named Wula. And Wula is not her true name. Her true name is concealed, much like, well, much like the names are for seers and people who walk unusual paths. Uh, that way, their true name is concealed and they can move as they need to um, without concern that their family members will be harmed, that their tribe will be harmed. 
she has a tribal name, which is Wula, who, uh, but she's uh, also. Okay, go I, ahead. I just want to remind you, we're going to yeah, leave off the phrase tribe or tribal. Uh, correct. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, she has a public name. Put it that way. Okay. Um, and that public name is how people know her. It's how she interacts with people. It's the name that she gives when she's moderating or mediating situations, when she's healing people. But there's only one other person who knows that name, and that is her mentor. Um, she's interesting in that in this, her mentor chooses for them and this may or may not be something that's true with other groups, that one of the eyes, and in fact, it's the eye that they use most frequently for eye scans and so on and so forth, or that was used in the past, is deadened. So it's a way of gaining not quite second sight, but just making it a bit more difficult for machines to read her, to identify who she is. And that goes in keeping with the name without with with using a pseudonym to move about her archetype is mediator her temperate her temperament is maverick she does things unusually uh it's it's rare that she does something for, according to any kind of policy or procedure she operates more on intuition um and trying to guess what's going to happen next i mean a lot of the things that we're facing are based on AI. So acting unexpectedly can break their algorithms. So with that said, uh, her origin bonus is natural resources. When she performs first aid, she can spend supply points equal to damage rating of the patient's entry to count as having a first aid kit. When she creates a trap or a hindrance, she can spend a supply point to add plus one to the difficulty to add or remove that trap. She can reassure people when she attempts a skill test to help an ally who is exhausted, reduces the difficulty by one. If she succeeds, they regain spirit equal to half of her talk skill rounding up. When the GM spends three or more threat at once, she regains one spirit. When her spirit reaches zero, she automatically fails on all resolve tests and adds plus one difficulty to all other tests. And she has a crossbow and a med kit that she walks around with. Are you imagining that the dreamers uh, that you're that that Wula comes from, and, and is she her right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, are they part of a larger community? Are they a stand offish, like a separate community of separate set of peoples? The particular ones that that you come from. I think the dreamers. When the dreamers hear about a new child being born, a new a person being welcomed into the society, they go and visit the parents and look at the child. And there are times when that child is taken to become a dreamer and separated from their family and separated from what they have known. So that's another way of obscuring their identity in case they're ever captured by the machines. So they do, they, they are respected. They I mean, they have the, this exchange with other communities. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this role as a mediator, is that a, a, a common one among dreamers or is that an unusual one? I think it's relatively common. Okay. Um, in that it's basically a dedicated, it's almost like a monastic, Mm -hmm. calling okay um in that they're separated they come in they do things they help various communities and sometimes they live in various communities um sometimes they leave the dreamer community and go live in a civilization or another society for a time sometimes for the remainder of their lives uh that's less common yeah. but uh, the the picture you have kind of looks a little bit ageless. So are you imagining uh, her as young, uh, you know, uh, in her 20s, uh, you know, middle age? Like, well, how are you imagining her for that? 
Um, I'm thinking of her somewhere between in in her early to mid twenties. Okay. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, let's come to Mads. Uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Belu, she, her is a spear uh, who has the archetype of guardian. So, um, and their temperament is conspicuous. I really love the description uh, quick to anger, quick to laughter, and grab existence with both hands. So, um, of her peoples, um, I think, you know, she's, she's big, like she's tall, she's built, um, muscular, um, in the, in a, like a survivor type of way again mm -hmm. like not like like not big and burly but just i mean like again like just enough to be able to to get around and go quickly and 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 uh, with strength and um yeah i mean you know her her mood can be uh, a little mercurial um but when it comes to the serious business of defending and guarding um uh, whatever group she's with whether it be you know like on the nomadic trek to like uh maybe another uh settlement or something like that or another place um with the seasons then you know she um will use the skills of um of guarding so she will you know herd people in in front of her you know, to, 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 to go off wherever they need to go and then like, you know, stay behind and then either, um, like draw fire from machines or she will stalk, um, uh, machines that seem to be, um, uh, coming after her group. And, uh, you know, she has like the, the glyphs of marking her body and clothes to hide from machine site to be able to do this. And then she can even attempt to hide without cover or concealment um, from a machine um, to to do so. Uh, so her peoples are skilled in doing that. And um, in, it says that instead of any other weapons, um, she has an electro spear. So I didn't see any stats for that. So I'm not. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll get you the, the, the stats for that. Uh, let me pull that up right now. Okay. I mean, uh, so I'm assuming that takes the place of the security pulser um, yeah. that she's given. Um, yeah. I, I believe she still has light armor, though, because, right. I mean, again, like, you know, to do the glyphs to to be able to um, take away from machine sight. I mean, like, you know, she's they still have to have those those uh, not technical aspects, but just, uh, again, some symbols and <laughs> magic of this place to be able to to do the things that they do um so it's a control of a tech that is in between the machines as well as like you know old ways and and are you mentioning it i mean are those painted on are those drawn on what are those those look like are they changeable how are you imagining those those glyphs for you i think for for her i think again it's where they're symbolic to her personally. It's like part of the raising of these guardians within the the community. Um, like there's personal glyphs to be able to to um, hide themselves as a person, as an individual. And then of course, like the general glyphs to be able to hide the clothing, the armor. And that sort of thing. So they're very, they're very um, individualized for uh, the particular circumstance. Mm -hmm. um, and but these are the things that are taught. Like these are things that that are trained into the into those that are raised as spears in, as as guardians of the community of the of the group. Right. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, so the electro spear uh, is a, a melee weapon. Okay. Uh, its damage is shocked four so it does four points shocked mm -hmm. uh it has the breaker quality uh breaker means that when you're fighting machines it halves the uh armor that they have mm -hmm. uh and like a number of weapons you'll see a number of weapons say powered mm -hmm. and then parentheses break what that means is uh you can 
like spend all of the charge from a weapon to do some extra damage mm -hmm. uh but then you need to at a break time uh, uh uh spend time to have it recover uh uh there are different levels of of recharge rating break is a pretty short one so that's what that does okay uh all right, I think that gives us a good sense of who you are. Uh, let's uh, come on to uh, Daniel. Hey, uh, I'll be playing uh, Hene Gannett, they, them. Uh, Hene is an archivist with the archetype of tech. Uh, their temperament is fixed, so I imagine that that means that they're pretty stubborn once they've set their mind on something, and they probably have some uh they probably come into this with some pretty strong opinions um i suspect related to uh sort of the role of technology and whether or not we want to um pursue it right um i think that henne is old or at least as old as uh people tend to get um in this setting so i'm thinking like i don't know mid 40s maybe okay. um <clears throat> they have uh, as the kids say seen a lot of shit um, so they carry with them lots of scars, uh, probably some, um, uh, maybe like a limp, um, things like that, right? Just, uh, sort of physical, um, embodiments of, uh, of, uh, clearly, uh, clearly weathered history. Um, I think as an archivist, they, uh, they belong to sort of this, this group or this order of people who um when the weather uh, like when the seasons have turned uh turned hard they retreat to sort of this um this bunker in a mountain and they they experiment and they um they tell stories of places they've been and things like that and when the seasons are conducive uh, they all wander off in different directions to find new, fascinating, miraculous things to to bring back and to study and um, to take apart or put together um, as as you do. Uh, I think Hene knows that this is their last trip out. Um, they their body is is giving up. Their um, they get tired more easily than they used to. Um, maybe they have a, um, a cough that has just lasted too long and they don't expect that it will go away. Um, I think that their, um, their trinket is, uh, they wear, um, around their neck on a chain, they wear sort of like a crystalline, um, key card and it is the card that they use to enter the bunker. Hmm. Um, it is also sort of a symbol of their rank, like the, I don't know, maybe they're colored differently or something like that. Um, they're sort of stoop shouldered, uh, a little bent because they carry a large backpack that clinks and clangs with, uh, all kinds of, uh, mysterious, um, uh, uh, you know, artifacts of the, the, the past technologies and things like that that they can pull from uh and they're constantly putting things together or um um playing with you know small bits of technology that they're that they're trying to to turn into something interesting uh so they have the talent of tinkerer i have no idea what any of this means sure. uh exactly but uh, it looks like when you create a device using supply points uh reduce the number of supply points you spend by one when you disassemble a device you regain one supply point uh, so basically you are able to on the fly create useful things and we kind of assign like what would be a typical supply cost for it and you're able to uh, assemble it uh, uh, from that. Like if you wanted like a, a, a shovel of some kind, you know, that might be a supply point uh, or something more sophisticated like a telescope or something. Uh, that'd be the, the kind of thing that you could do to uh, add a truth to the scene you know, give yourself fictional positioning or, or give yourself a bonus for things. Sweet. Uh, so you have a stylus, which is a nanotech device that is used to mark and create glyphs on things. Uh, uh, what do you think that stylus looks like? 
Uh, that is a great question. So it's used like it is used to to like literally mark on physical objects. Is Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Um, I think maybe it is like um, <laughs> I think maybe it is like a sort of like a really ornate looking um, uh, like one of those like full finger rings, you know? Mm hmm. Um, and it fits on um, their ring finger on their right hand, and it actually emits like a small um, laser or something like that, right? So they can like etch uh, etch into stone or metal or whatever with it. So uh, you have a choice of two glyphs that you can start with. Uh, one of them is uh let me get to this page here uh is what they call a discharge glyph uh you make a quickness study test uh, uh and apply it to a an object or a location and then the first time a machine sees that glyph uh it's going to make them discharge all of their powered uh, uh items and weapons so uh mm. it'll keep them from firing things off uh, the other one is, you could choose from is the glyph for ignore, uh, where again you make a test to apply it to an object and uh, or a person, and the machines will ignore that object or person marked with it uh, until it, you know, does something hostile or offensive against uh, that machine. Hmm. I think I will do the latter one. Yeah, that does sound cool, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> uh all right all right is that uh, uh is that in one of the tabs or is that in a um i put in the uh folder in the keeper a thing with the uh like the, all the equipment uh in it uh as a pdf Got it. and so that's what i'm i'm referencing there lovely thank you uh all right i think that gives us a good sense of who you are let's take our first break we'll take 10 and when we come back, we'll talk about connections and, and putting people together and figuring out how you all know each other. So uh, take 10 and we'll be back. So where we're going to be starting is with the, the four of you together on uh, the, the road uh, traveling possibly to uh, a larger settlement nearby or whatever with the thought that you have traveled together for some time uh, during this season maybe you've known each other longer but at least you know have uh, been around each other for uh, a few weeks uh Lazarus how is Wula different from the other dreamers that you have dealt with in your community? What, what makes her distinct to you? Uh, let's see. Um, I think that Wula is, I mean, even though Wula is part of this group that doesn't, um, that kind of lives apart. Um, and, and I think that oftentimes the, the, the dreamers that they, they, they don't interact with, people outside their group in, in quite as, uh, friendly a way, but, but Wula, I think, you know, despite the fact that she's a dreamer, um, she's, she's sometimes funny, right. That, that there's like a, a kind of greater, I don't know, I would say greater social skills, uh, than one normally expects from them. 
So for for some of the other dreamers that you've met, they've been maybe a little bit standoffish, a little bit, yeah. you know, uh, but Woola seems more more personable. Uh, does that work for you, Pocket? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, yeah. So you've been been impressed by that, different from from the the dreamers that you've uh, uh, often dealt with. Woola, you're tapped more into some of the spiritual side of things talk about the the eye marking and that uh kind of uh, uh ideas about vision you have had a vision about belu uh i either early on in your meeting or more recently you can tell me uh oh, what 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 is it that you've seen and you know is it is it you know a very literal vision or is it more metaphorical what what is it that that you have seen there the first time i saw belu i was immediately struck by a vision that was as clear to me as if it was happening in front of me in that moment it was belu facing off against far too many machines. And I saw the outcome of that as graphically as if it was appearing in front of me in that moment. And I decided to follow Bellu around to ensure that that, to ensure that that future, which I think is only a possible one, does not come to pass. Have you told Bellu of your vision? Absolutely not. Okay. Interesting. Uh, Belu, uh, when you first met Gannett, or or, or how much? Uh, how is that first name being said, Daniel? Uh, Hene. Hene. Uh, should I just call you Hene or Gannett? Sure. Wh which one? Because <laughs> <laughs> otherwise I'll, I'll get it wrong all the time for myself. Uh, let's do Hene. Okay. Okay. So, so uh, uh, Belu, when you first met Hene, uh, you had already heard like rumors or a gossip or a tale or a story about them before you met them. Uh, what was that story? And did it fit or not fit? with your experience of Hene afterwards? I think, <clears throat> I think Belu is experienced. So definitely in the field and, and Hene I think is a little older. And so <clears throat> one of the stories that Belu had heard was that um, uh, someone had made a suggestion for how to deal with a particular machine in terms of uh, 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 trapping it or, 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 or bringing it down. And Hene was so fixed with a particular idea that they were not even going to to brook any argument about nope this is the way it's got to be done this like you know my way is going to work and the people that had told me what had happened said that they also had a backup plan just in case that that idea didn't work um like kind of like a plan, like a the, the the group B as for for Henne's group A, and uh, Henne's idea worked, and group B stood down and just watched as um, group A took care of it, and uh, they didn't doubt they didn't doubt Henne again, although the person that <clears throat> had proposed doing group B uh, pretty much transferred to um, someplace else. Okay. <laughs> so they didn't have to deal with Hene's, Hene's um, uh, fixed thinking, I guess. <laughs> and has your experience with Hene lined up with that? Like, like has Hene been that kind of forthright thinker in, in the times that you've worked with him? 
them? I think... Yeah, I think I think it's pretty much lined up with uh, how Henny works, but I also think that that Belu's uh, like <clears throat> would probably go ahead and do whatever they you know whatever she thought was best, and then like take into account what Henny said might work too, and so uh, yeah, I, I think. She tries to shake Henne a little bit out of their their stubbornness, and then Henne tries to tries to uh, bring Bellu more grounded. So okay. I think it's good for both of them. <laughs> Does that work for you, Henne? Oh yeah, Henne's always right. So that sounds okay. that sounds perfect. Ah, <laughs> uh, Henne, uh, uh, you're in your forties. You're old. Uh Lazarus is in, you know, I think we said uh, early 20s, uh, uh, young. Uh, you have kind of consistently kept an eye on Laz, you know, uh, from from a young age. Uh, why is that? What is it? Is it that you knew somebody? Uh, is it that you had a vision about them? Is it uh you know uh, a a lost love like what 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 has made you kind of been a been a long time person who's watched over them yeah i think it's i think it's actually considerably simpler than any of those things i think that um that during one of henne's you know trips out to wherever it is that Lazarus lives or lived at the time, um, they witnessed him um, dealing with a problem uh, involving machines and just saw like this sort of instinctual understanding of them that both sort of like surprised and awed Hene, but also made Hene extremely jealous. Hene mm -hmm. has had to work so hard um, to get the knowledge that they have and has had to struggle so hard to retain it all. Um, and some of these things just come so simply to, to Lazarus. Um, so Hene is sort of, um, I think, maybe trying to... Um, trying to maybe groom Lazarus for indoctrination, not indoctrination, but uh, acceptance into, you know, the, the order that Hene is in, um, but is also maybe trying to subtly sabotage them. Does that work for you, Lazarus? Yeah, I, I, I like the, the little ambivalence there at the end. <laughs> it's not the jealousy, but also kind of a, a admiration. Yeah, that's good. All right. So the four of you know each other, have, have worked together in the past. And where we take up at the start of this is uh, you have been on the road for uh, a little while. And... You are uh, at a, a smaller settlement that uh, to kind of, as you often do, you've stopped over to provide advice and assistance in particular. They're in the process of uh, doing some plowing and some farming in a new area. Uh, and essentially for room and water and board uh you take the time for these last couple of days to to help them out with this this process so uh, a few buildings around uh this kind of field uh like Lazarus this really is your wheelhouse so what what does that look like what what kind of thing do you think you're doing um well, I, I don't think Lazarus, I mean, he's done a lot of plowing in his days, but I don't think that's what, what Lazarus is, is, is in for, right? 
for right now. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that that Lazarus is uh, involved in um, sweeping around the perimeter, just kind of, um, you know, as as things are kind of going on right around the kind of center of the uh, of this um, town, I, I think Lazarus is is kind of going out to kind of make sure that that you know things are kind of assessed more, you know, not in the far distance, but but you know, it just feels like you know that there may be you know things that this settlement hasn't taken stock of in terms of its surroundings. Yeah, they clearly you I think you have in your time walking around have seen that it's maybe built on some older uh things. You know, they've got their barns and their crop areas and stuff, but as you kind of wander out, you realize there might be some other uh, uh areas here. Uh Wula, what is it that you're doing to help out with this this farming process? I think I'm mediating tra uh, trades from nearby townships and settlements to get seeds in or additional equipment, whether it's permanently transferred or merely borrowed, negotiating payments uh, or trade agreements to ensure that these communities are able to better rely on each other in the future and so forth. Yeah. So you probably have some documents that you've carried with you from other villages and some seeds and you're, you've done those exchanges. Uh, 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 here in the the time that you've you've been here for the last uh, day or two, okay, okay. Uh, the four of you are uh, kind of on one of those breaks. The sun is kind of beating down, and you've sat down on uh, uh, and around a, a stump that you haven't been able to clear. Uh, uh, kind of. Uh, uh, drinking your water and having the, the the porridge or the bread that has been made. And as you are there, there is suddenly uh, a rending sound and then a ripping and suddenly a little ways away, you will see one of the barns explode flame shoot up and then the ground that you're at actually ripples and there is a tearing sound as something gives way and the the four of you suddenly find yourselves like not a big fall but just maybe a, a few feet like something under the ground gave way and then there's this rain of uh, debris and rubble coming down and there's that you know uh, in the movie we would see the dirt come into the camera uh, and we see the the shake and the sound goes out uh, from that uh, uh, and Bellu when, when you shake your head off you realize you were kind of maybe maybe there was a, a plate or a basement uh, underneath the area that you were at that has kind of given way uh, you're in this room and there is stuff has fallen on you and you're kind of jammed, jammed underneath it. What do you do? So we literally fell through. Yeah. The ground. Something, something crashed up above some kind of explosion hit and actually broke the ground. It looks like this maybe was some kind of, uh, I'm going to say it my most Midwestern root cellar. Uh, uh, you know, you can see there are old cans and jars down in here, but you know, some of the, the concrete and beams have kind of fallen on you. You can kind of see daylight up, but there's that haze of, of, uh, uh, d dust and smoke. Um, yeah, I think she screams, it's like, get me the hell out of here. And then uh, she will, like you know, do her best to try to maneuver out of this this mess that's that's on top of her. Absolutely. Um, so we're gonna actually do a a, a test here. This okay. is gonna be a, a difficulty one test. Okay. Uh, this is gonna be might plus survive. Right, so, so 
what we do, uh, uh, so what that means is your might is a 10. So we're looking for a 10 or less. Mm -hmm. And then survive is a two. If you get a two or a one, it's two successes. But anything under a 10 is a success. So okay. let's have you roll 2d20 and let's see what that looks like. Okay, 2d20. Ah, it's right there, duh. Okay. So that's one success. So, okay. you know, you push, get this off of you uh, and can look around. And uh, I think nearby, uh, as you kind of uh, uh, can see your other companions, uh, they have not quite gotten pinned in uh, as badly as you can. But as you look up right now outside, from where you're at, you're just seeing that kind of black cloud of smoke and dust uh, obscuring uh, the fields and the settlement. We'll come back to you in just a second. You're the first one kind of up and out. Uh, Hene, uh, you've, you've uh, you know, fallen down into here, kind of slid down. Uh, you see Bellu push this beam uh, off of herself and uh, uh, kind of pop up. What do you do, Hene? I think um, Hene is going to uh, look around for the others and, you know, like call out for Wula, Laz. Are you okay? Uh, and uh, uh, Laz, Wula, you hear that. The, again, that's still the ringing in your ears. You mostly had the wind knocked out of you by the fall and you're kind of covered with with a uh, a thin layer of soil and dirt uh and something of your lunch uh uh there uh, La Laz will, will yell back uh also kind of cursing saying this this is exactly what I was telling them today that that you know people don't study the land enough before they start kind of going in and building things. I mean, that they're building themselves on top of, you know, who knows what. But, you well, know, Laz is trying to scramble out, uh, scramble out too, right, to get, a, get, get make sure that that he's, he's uh, out of this uh, collapsed area. So, well, just because we're going to want to engage with the, the mechanics just to, to do this, let's have you uh, make... Uh, this feels more like maybe uh, a uh, a quickness plus survive. Okay. So that's uh, eight slash four for you. And I'm just doing the 2d20. 2d20. So two eight, so that's two successes. So this is difficulty one. So... Uh, it's maybe a little early, but right now I'm going to throw a momentum into the momentum pool, or you've got that extra success. You could spend that to like ask a question here as you do this action. Um, I, I, um, oh, it's tempting to take the momentum, but I think I will ask a question. Okay. What is it you want to know? Well, I mean, I, I want to know what what that what is causing uh, what has caused that explosion that we saw, right? This thing that came kind of erupting up uh, from was it a warehouse that it was? Uh, yeah, I, I think you can hear moving off in the distance as you kind of get your head up, you hear the rumbling sound. And you are pretty sure that some sort of waker, waking machine uh, uh, came by. Uh, it didn't come into the settlement, but it clearly fired off its weaponry that struck uh, and uh, did that. I mean, you can kind of tell the general direction uh, it's it's headed in, but it is it is moving along at at, at a pace uh right now does that seem like fair info yeah and i think you know laz is actually feeling down on the ground to feel the vibrations and is telling others yeah i, I can feel the steps of that waker 
uh, and and pointing to the direction where where they they feel like the steps are are coming from. Let me come back to you, Hannah, and then I'm going to come to Wula. Uh, is there anything else you want to do here uh, in this cellar? Uh, do you want to climb up? Do you want to look around? Do you want to help Wula out? What do you want to do? Yeah, so I think um, uh, so Wula is still a little pinned. Is that right? Uh, I think just just like a, a thin layer of dirt. Okay, okay, that's fine then. And and uh, Bello and Laz seem fine. So um, I think that um, yeah, I think Henny's going to try to get out of here. Okay. Um, so we'll climb out maybe. Okay. Uh, so that feels like a, a quickness move. Okay. So that's uh, nine slash two for you. All right. And that is on two d twenty. Yep. Boom. Oh. So that's one success. Uh, one success. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you will be able to kind of follow up behind Laz and climb up out into this again, coughing. And and you can hear the sound of fires uh, and maybe even like timbers crashing from uh, the, the rest of that settlement. Uh, clearly, clearly other people got hit uh, and there are buildings that are on on fire over there. Um, Wula, uh, kind of shake yourself clean. And what do you do? Laz, I'm really relieved that it's a waker and not just an attempt for you to remove that stump that we were sitting on. Just shake myself off a little bit, knock some dust off, start climbing up. So are we following this thing or are we just going are we just going to like stay here in the settlement and try to extinguish fires and help anybody who's injured? We should probably try to do both. I mean, it, the waker's going that way and the settlement is the other way. So a little right. difficult I mean, to do we both. We should probably split up and do both. I mean, Bellu's going to definitely, you know, uh, be furious about it. And then once she hears what Laz said, she's going to go after it. <clears throat> that waker. Okay. Uh, uh, so, yes. Oh, I was just going to say, I think I think Henne will look at the other two and kind of shrug and then limp after Bellu. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Hula, you can get up out. Uh, you will see that there are fires burning. You hear people crying for help. Uh, uh, in the ruins of this, uh, you can move through that and continue on if you want to pursue the the waker. Uh, uh, but it's kind of a like a a, a battle zone uh, there uh, of of wreckage and damage. Uh, Bellu, what do you do? Um. <clears throat> hmm. Can she tell if there's anything else like like the waker is moving away? But was there any, like, is there any other possible machines that are going to attack the settlement? Absolutely. Let's have you make uh, an insight plus study. So eight slash I don't know your uh yeah uh, eight slash one. <laughs> All right. That's a success. So your question is, are there other threats right now? Right. Uh, I think that you will hear uh, and imagine that you've come up out of this field. There's to your north and uh, east. There's the sort of the burning settlement. The smoke is around in the air. The, The waker is moving on past that at a trundle. But you'll hear the sounds of figures moving and swigging heavy objects. And you think that there are some people on the other side that are moving into the village uh, and perhaps causing mayhem, if not like finishing off survivors. Does that seem fair? 
Oh yeah. Uh, do you say anything to the to the group, or what's your reaction when when you realize that? Um, I, she's going to 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 sit to look back and see who's behind her. Um, if it's just Henne, obviously just to to Henne, but um, she's going to call out. I hear invaders going to take care of them now. So you'll take off uh, uh, in the direction of that. Uh, 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 Hene, do you follow? I think Hene is looking after the uh, like the trail of destruction led by the Waker, and you can tell they really, really want to go that way. Um, and they kind of look back and forth between that trail and Bellu and say, oh, hell, and follow Bellu. Okay. Uh, 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 Laz, Ula? I think Laz has a similar reaction that, that Henne did. I mean, Laz was, you know, like, I, I don't like, you know, a waker walking around is is something that one wants to keep one's eye on. But, you know, looks back at Belu, who's just kind of yelled out about, right, this this other group uh, kind of coming in and says, but, uh, you know, we we can't we we can't just leave the the settlement uh the way it is uh when when they're still under attack uh so uh you will 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 move to follow hesitantly but but you do uh and wula my crossbow is slung over my shoulder well normally now it's in my hands, and I'm doing I'm doing quick triage as I move through the settlement, trying to see if I see anything that is immediately life threatening. Okay. Because if there if I see anything like that, I'm going to have to stop and at least stop the bleeding. Okay. Uh, we're going to kind of come around to a little more like uh, we're going to kind of set up for this next scene, which would be kind of an, uh, a little bit more of an action scene, and I'll kind of set the the stage here. Uh, as the four of you move forward kind of into the, the smoke uh, and mist, you can see that there's uh, uh, that barn that was absolutely destroyed. Uh, you will see that some of the smaller outbuildings have been hit. There are people uh, uh, unconscious on the ground from the shock wave. There are some people who were clearly killed. Uh, you'll see that the livestock that was around, the fence has been knocked down and those have scattered out uh, uh, and have run uh, terrified from the sounds and the explosions and the fire. Uh, you will see that there is what you know is kind of the, the sort of gathering house for this small settlement. Uh, it looks like it's on fire and uh, a portion of that has kind of uh, uh, collapsed in. And you can tell that there are people in there. Uh, but you will see coming down this, this sort of way, walking towards you are three figures. And I'm going to screen share a picture here. Let me see. Da, 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 da. There we go. Let's let's do that. See if that works. It'll take a second to resolve. Uh, there are these three figures. Long, scraggly hair. They have like caked metallic dust and paint on their faces. You'll see that around their arms in places they have wrapped wires. Uh, and you will know that these are thralls. And thralls are people that kind of worship the wakers. They have kind of a machine cult that they follow uh, and they're, they're raiders as well. And there's three of them there. Uh, they have these kind of w wicked hooked uh, spears uh, and they are, are moving. And when they see someone uh, alive, they are, are moving and, and uh, approaching them to finish them off. Uh, so, Balu, we're going to start with you. 
oh, she's pissed and she is going to have a war cry. And uh, yeah, um, I mean, probably like, they don't even know their their own like, designation. But I mean, I think she's going to say she's going to say like death to thralls. And then she's going to come come in with her with her electro spear. <clears throat> uh, so uh, you take a rush up uh, to engage that first one mm -hmm. uh, kind of before they realize that that there are some people here who are a threat to them. Uh, so uh, this is an uh, attack roll that's going to happen. And that is going to be uh, might uh, plus uh, a fight. So that's 10 slash four for you. Okay. And then you'll roll and then I'll roll for them for their defense to see if I can match or beat what okay. you've got there. Sure. Okay. So that will, that will miss. Now, here is some of your options. Uh, you can spend uh, a spirit to re-roll one of those dice if you want. You can spend two spirit to re-roll both of those dice. Spirit is, though, your hit points as well. Uh, yeah, she does not hold with these <clears throat> with these uh, waker worshippers, so I'm going to spend two spirit. Now, right. is it just um, out of character? Like, the, the spirit I'm taking away from is the one in red or the one from my attribute? It is the one in red. Thank you. All right. So and I've got one success right now okay. for their defense. So you're going to want to get two successes here. Yeah, that's the point. Okay. So spending two to re-roll both. <coughs> oh, excuse me. So that is two successes. Uh, so what does that look like? Uh, they are essentially figures that don't have a uh, uh, spirit to spend to, to resist the injury. So what do we see happen <laughs> when you are up on them? Oh, the smoke's yeah. getting to you. Yeah. I can tell. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Well, she, she had her, her war cry and, and such, and she's pissed uh, seeing this. So she's literally um, going in charging at them, but then like, like, you know, working in a circle so she's so she's like swinging her spear around and then like turning with the spear as she's trying to to hack into all three of them at once and then like trying to jab at tender areas on their body as she's like again working in a circle trying to keep their attention on her and okay. away from from the 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 civilians or anybody else absolutely um, absolutely so you will will move yeah, uh, get that uh, range, get uh, in past the defenses of one of them and drive that spear uh, and, and they'll cry out as they they drop. But then the other two are definitely like they are focused on you. Hene, what are you doing? You're here, you see this fire, you're seeing these two figures. What is it your your goal here? Um. <clears throat> I think that um, yeah, I think Henne is just going to try to engage them with his um, or with their um, uh, what is it, hunting pulsar. Mm -hmm. um, I think that they're going to try to identify uh, if if either of the remaining two seem to be um, like a leader or uh any additionally dangerous than the other um and try to engage that one but otherwise just uh so is just, your is your plan more on this round to to assess or to take that let's shot? um actually let's 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 go ahead and assess i don't i don't really see okay. uh Hene as being much of a, a combatant but i do think that maybe um sort of the uh the the group that Hene is with actually has some dealings with um with these folks from time to time they do some trade and stuff like that yeah that makes sense uh let's have you roll uh insight with study so okay. 10 slash 3 for you a thing i'm actually reasonably good at let's see 
right. now I'm going to pause right now. Ooh, so oh, okay. you already have you, have you have it? Okay. I already rolled. Sorry. You already rolled. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but then that's good. That's two successes. Yeah. Now, one of the other things you can do is you can spend spirit before you roll to give yourself an extra D20. Oh, okay. Yeah, just telling you that you could, and you could do that up to three times if you want to burn through your HP. Uh, you can 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 do that. But I mean, I have four of them. That's that's plenty, right? Yeah, you're losing money not <laughs> spending it. Uh, so two successes. So what's your first question? Um, I think my first question is, um, um, which of these um appears to be the leader? It actually looks to you like these are like rabble from mm -hmm. a larger group, like uh, the the juniors that have been sent uh, to like go in and finish off people here uh, in this this village, uh, and you suspect that there might be a larger group of these thralls, uh, you know. Uh, uh, either on the waker or following in uh, uh, the wake of the waker. <laughs> right. The wake of the waker. I like it. Uh, okay. Fantastic. And then, so you've got another uh, success. So you can uh, either put momentum in the pool or you can ask another question. Yeah. I think I will put momentum in the pool. Let's see what okay. that does. Yeah. So you've got one momentum. You can put that in uh, the pool. Uh so uh, to tell you the mechanically what momentum does, let me come to that page here because it's a little bit different from other things. So when you get extra success with the momentum, you could spend it to ask a question. Uh, you can spend two points of momentum, either immediately after a roll for the momentum to generate there or you know, with momentum from the pool to create a truth, essentially to put an aspect on the scene. Uh, to establish something. Uh, you can spend momentum to restore spirit. Uh, you can spend uh, one momentum to get one spirit, two momentum, uh, uh, three momentum to get two. It's, it's a rising scale, but it allows you to recover hit points. There are some other things you can do, like increasing damage or taking an extra action in combat following up but those are the, like the big ones are asking for information uh creating truth and re recovering spirit cool do they do they go away or degrade on their own or do they just like live there until we use them forever and ever uh so momentum will stay in the pool and at the end of any scene will tick your momentum down by one gotcha okay, okay. now i'll mention just to, to, to go over the mechanics i have momentum too you may see that there's a little thing called threat on there. Uh, that is what the, the GM gets to activate uh, abilities from uh, foes and to add dice or, or rather add uh, uh, effects to them. They can can do stuff with with that. Uh, a threat is handled a little bit differently in this than in regular uh, 2D20, uh, but we'll kind of put that to the side for the moment. Uh, uh, Laz, you see Bellow has rushed up and engaged and kind of taken the attention, occupy the attention of these three, uh, even as she drops one of them. Uh, but there is this fire going on. Uh, what do you want to do? And uh, that fire is going on in the, in the barn. It uh, looks like one of the buildings that had people in it uh uh the that looks like the some of the structure has fallen and jammed people trapped them inside even as this building is on fire yeah i i think i think laz is uh you know mutters belu can can take those fiends on uh but laz is is running off to the to the uh, burning and collapsing building to see uh, if there's anybody who needs to be uh, pulled out of the out absolutely of the uh, so now let's talk about how helping people works 
just in case Wula wants to help or if you two want to do individual actions. Basically, helping works like this. There's a primary person who's making the roll, who rolls their 2d20. And then if somebody's spending their action to assist, they will roll a single d20. And if they get a success, they can add that as long as the, the, the starter person has gotten a success. Uh, so Wula, uh, you see that Laz is heading towards us. I just want to check in before we move forward. Uh, are you, do you want to assist Laz with this? Do you want to uh, do something uh, on your own with the helping? Or do you want to uh, move somewhere else? What do you think? Do I see anybody who's mortally wounded and is going to die without assistance? Uh, I think you are seeing uh, there's at least one person there who has uh, been stabbed by these thralls when they came in and is is bleeding out right now. Okay. I am going to help them. Laz can deal with the door on his own. Okay. Uh, so, Laz, uh, let's have you uh, make a roll to essentially get people out of this. Are you focusing more on putting the fire out? Are you focusing on getting the door open or doing something else? Like, tell me what your, what your approach here is. I, I think, I think Laz's main concern is to get in, uh, you look into the rubble and if there's somebody who needs to need some assistance to get out of there to immediately lend that assistance. Okay. Uh, so let's do this as uh, a quickness and survive. Is that okay. fine? Mm -hmm. That's eight slash four. Let's have you roll. All right. So that's two successes. Uh, so you will be able to to kind of get in and uh, push aside. Uh, and if you want to spend that, you know, both those successes, I think you can get a passage such that that people can start to move out of there. Does that seem fair? Yeah, and I think while while Laz is doing that, is also very vocal to the people that might be trapped in there, kind of giving them right the the voice saying that I'm clearing a path. Come come this way, right? Yeah, they're they're, they're you hear the sound of them. They're they're, they're pushing pulling people out they're they're pushing the 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 teens that are in there up to you to grab on and are are trying to get out of here even as you're kind of hearing the the creaking of this but with two successes that's that's pretty good so you are doing this uh with with alacrity uh woola you are running up to uh essentially try to uh stabilize this person uh, uh kind of close by where bellu and these two are fighting right mm-hmm uh -huh. Okay, uh, then let's see uh, for uh, that with our, and you have a first aid kit, so that's a truth that you have, so you can do this with with uh, uh, ease. Uh, uh, let's have you roll, I think it's still going to be quickness, because okay. you're trying to do this uh, speedily, uh, sure. but I that's think- fair. Uh, uh, I think survivor study is appropriate here for the skill. Um, let's go with study because I have to look at the wound to figure out how best to seal it up. Okay. Uh, so that's a, an eight slash three. All righty. And I am waiting for the die roller. Okay. There's a five. So that's so a success. success. Uh, so I think you can bandage to stabilize this person, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, I but I think like right now you haven't gotten them out of the danger zone uh, in terms okay. of there being a fight going on around. Does that seem fair? Yes, but I'd like to spend one spirit to re-roll a die. That absolutely. Minutes. Look at that. There's a six. Nice. So two successes. So. Uh, uh, what do we see you do? Um, really, it's field medicine from long ago. I'm using some, it's basically a really sticky adhesive that we've learned how to harvest from tree bark and tree sap. And it seals the wound so I can actually use it and kind of form a paste. 
and then seal up veins and wounds and injuries so that this paste will kind of just literally stop the bleeding Mm -hmm. until the person has a chance to heal on their own. So you slather that on uh, and then kind of grab, uh, uh, drag them away from where this malaise is happening, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Bellu, you have, as was your desire, gotten the attention of these two thralls. Uh, So we've kind of gone past what I would call a surprise round. So now you're going to go and then they're going to go. Um, can I take spirit gain when I'm the first PC to take a turn around, regain one spirit? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Yay. All right. Um, okay. So yeah, I mean like whatever I can do, I mean like I'm going to continue to, to keep them busy and I am going to, uh, continue to press my attack on the both of them to, uh, again, take the heat off of anybody else and, and just... Yeah, take them out. Perfect. So this is might plus fight. Okay. Uh, so that's 10 slash four. Uh, if you want to, you can spend a spirit to give yourself an extra d20, or you can just roll with the 2d20. Yeah, let me just roll and then see what I get, and then I will, you know. Will we roll? Okay. We roll, yeah. Ooh. Uh, So that is two successes. Let me roll for them. Oof. Uh, So they do not defend. uh, And one of the rolls they rolled was a 20. Uh, So I think you will see that uh, as this thrall is kind of uh, coming out and trying to parry, I think it goes wide and it actually knocks down the other thrall as its uh, blade comes down. It doesn't hit it, but sends it sprawling to the ground. So, you know, it's at a disadvantage. Uh, but uh, you got your hit, uh, beat their defense, and that's four. So what what does that look like? Like, what did you do fighting-wise here to, to get the advantage and topple this second guy? Yeah, I think <clears throat> because of his uh, <laughs> friendly fire isn't um, the, the one thrall knocks over the the other one i think she takes advantage of that and she literally will take her electro spear and she will <clears throat> bring it down into the back of the one and then immediately shove it into the into the into the face of the other okay yeah. uh uh this uh uh so you've taken out one uh the uh the the, the one that's knocked down you know the, the blade has come close by uh uh it's gonna try and and get up and hit you the the knockdown essentially acts as a truth so the difficulty for it to hit you is going to be higher uh so i'm going to roll its roll to attack you okay and then you'll make a, a defense roll and you can add plus one for that truth of it had he had to get up to from being knocked down and for the defense roll is that is that still 2d20 or is that just one That'll be 2d20, uh, uh, and you're still in Malay, uh, okay. so it'll still be might plus fight for that. Okay. So let me roll for this fine fellow. Sure. Oh, oh, hit the 2d20 there. Uh, so I've got one success. So in order to uh, avoid uh, getting hit and taking damage, you need to get at least a success. More than that will act as momentum. Okay. Um, I want to use, <clears throat> pardon. I want to use defensive posture. Okay. So since it made a successful attack against me, I can add one to threat to reduce the damage rating of the attack's injury by two. In case, yeah. In case. Yeah. Well, I... we'll, uh, so so if it if you if you don't def- deflect, we'll, we'll 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 roll into that defensive posture. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so might plus fight. All right. Uh, so that's a six is a success uh, plus the difficulty. Uh, you'll actually be able to add a momentum to the momentum pool. Okay. Uh, uh, from that and and this this last one is is getting up uh, uh, to their feet. They missed you. They're they're pulling themselves up and trying to. Uh, you see them now, looking back like maybe maybe they should run, uh, and 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 get away. Uh, 
uh, let's come back to uh, Hene. Sure. Um, I think that um, Hene is going to see this last one turning and maybe starting to run uh, and is going to um, to go ahead and take a shot with the uh, hunting pulsar at it. Okay. Uh, so that uh, is a ranged attack. Uh, so that is done with uh, quickness and fight. Quickness and fight. All right. So it's nine and one. Yeah. Uh, that is terrible that is now <laughs> you could spend a spirit to re-roll uh i don't care that much it's fine okay yeah, yeah. uh so what does that look what is it like what does that rifle look like and what i mean it is a big nasty pulsar thing what what do we see on screen yeah i think it's like um it is like uh, sort of like this excessively long, um, obviously uh, made for like long range attacks, right? Mm -hmm. It is a sort of a weird combination of uh, natural elements and um, and technological ones. So it's got like uh, sort of like a uh, like a very ornately crafted wooden stock, right? Um, and it's got like. Uh, weird little things bristling all over it. It's very it looks kind of unwieldy. Mm -hmm. um it has sort of a he has like a or they have a an um sort of an energy cell on their back and um as they like get down on one knee and and sort of li laboriously point this thing towards uh the 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 enemy you can hear it sort of like um it sort of powers up and it goes whoop and right and then di then discharges um and i think that actually what happens here is probably it just fails to discharge okay. kind of like, boop, 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 and he has to like or they have to like bang on it you know to get it to go again like the lights kind of flicker and go off and they have to bang on it to get it to, to light back up i love it i love it you kind of sh shaking it doing the banging kind of looking at it uh 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 laz you've gotten uh uh most of these people out from uh this building uh however I'm going to spend two threat. And I think you get the last of these uh, people out of there, but you hear the sound of somebody inside the burning building who one person who's still trapped in there. You hear them calling. It looks like it might've been up on a, a upper floor and uh, they're jammed in there, but the boy, the building and the smoke and so on. What do you do? I don't think Lazarus even thinks that the, the adrenaline is pumping, um, you know, curses under his breath, but he he's immediately in there. I mean, he he's, he's nimble and quick and he's going to try to kind of get, get in to get this last person out. So I think that's going to be uh quickness plus survive uh, or move. Which one do you want to lean into for this? I think, I mean, probably survive. I mean, okay. I think that that he's he's encountered this kind of situation before, and he's scrappy uh, and kind of knows how to kind of navigate himself to kind of keep him, himself and others safe, or at least attempt to mm -hmm. in this kind of situation. So, so grab a cloth, throw some water on it, put it over your face, and and make your way in. Uh, right. uh, so, I think this is to get to them uh is going to be a difficulty too to 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 get up to where they are at here uh, okay and and i can um i can spend you can spend spirit if you want to give yourself an extra die um i think i'll do that okay yeah, I mean, this seems pretty uh, important here. Okay. Um, so that'll give me three. Yeah. Right. Three, 20, you need uh, eights or less. And a four or less is two successes. So I did I did get uh, a two on there. So that would be two successes, yeah. right? So you get up into this building and 
you can push your way through. What's the big obstacle for you? Is it is it flames? Is it the structure? Is it something else? I th I think the the big obstacle is just no no vision. Once okay. I get in there, I, I'm I'm you know it is just so smoky that. You know, I'm yelling out, they're yelling out. We're we're kind of just relying on right our echolocation <laughs> right and, maneuver to get through. I, yeah. And I think it is you kind of push, you find uh, uh, like what's left of a set of stairs, uh, and get up to this second floor. Uh, and essentially, there's there's a shelf that has fallen on this person, and you can get to them uh, and push it aside. Uh, I think you're still in this burning building, but you've gotten them unpinned, uh, uh, and you've kind of got a hold of them as they're they're coughing here. Luckily, they were close to the floor, though the smoke is still up, and uh, you can you know this smell uh, when you have a, a building that has some like old metals and trinkets and things like that. The smell is different from just burning wood smell. It kind of acrid and unpleasant uh, as you do this. Wula. Uh, you see this last thrall getting ready to take off. You see Bellu uh, facing them. Uh, you've gotten this wounded person clear. Uh, uh, you saw Laz run into the burning building. What are you doing? I am taking my crossbow and carefully aiming it at the thrall. Okay. Hmm. So one good thing about it, one good thing about having one eye is that you don't have to close the other one to aim. Absolutely. Uh, so that will be quickness plus fight. Okay. And I'd like to spend a spirit to get an extra die. 3d20. All righty. So my spirit is at seven. Roll 3d20. Oof. Uh, so that is a, a couple of successes there. Uh, is that enough to down the thrall? Oh yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, like, uh, uh, do, how how spectacular is this hit? Is it, it you know in the face? Is it in the chest? Do, does the crossbow bolt lift them up off the ground? Uh, uh, you know, uh, it pins them. Style? It <laughs> the crossbow bolt hits them with sufficient force to throw them forward and impale them into a tree face first. Okay. Uh, they and they just turn, kind of hang there limply. Yeah. Uh, catch them. It goes through and uh, uh, they're, they're by that, pushes them forward, cut, and they'll be jammed up, kind of uh, hanging there. Uh, Bellu, turned, got your spear up, and uh, you'll hear the uh, as his last one started to dash uh, as the bolt from Ula goes past. And she will uh, immediately turn and follow the path, and then see uh, Wula with the with the crossbow, and then she'll make a salute and thank you. Uh, and then what do you do, Wula? Or sorry, uh, Belu. Um, uh, look around. I, I mean, I'm a I'm guessing that the wake the waker is long gone, or is it still kind of trundling in that slow? ponderous no, way it, it, it was it was moving uh, okay. uh along the path uh uh so it is a ways away but do uh, i spot right. like any other threats no it looks point. like these three were just sent off split off in the main party here to uh try and uh cause damage okay then i'm gonna head back to to the the the, the settlement and then see if i can you know help um because I don't see Laz, and I think like Henny's like a, a little bit further behind me, but mm -hmm. you know, like still visible. So okay. I'm like, you know, um, I will run back and and then say like, "Where's Laz?" Uh, Henny. Um, <clears throat> I think Henny takes a few moments to get up off their knee where they where they took it right there, <clears throat> um, and. Uh, looks around i i'm sorry uh bello did you say you came up to henne to ask where laz is um whomever's closer whether it be you yeah, or i think i think um, uh, you know both both 
Mula and Hene kind of equidistant there on the the, the road okay. as Belu comes back and and shouts that out. Um, I think uh, you know Hene was kind of looking around, so they they probably saw where Laz went, mm-hmm. and we'll just sort of like uh, cover their mouth with um, uh, with some of the cloth from their their shirt and cough a little and point towards one of the flaming buildings where uh, where Laz was last seen. I mean, she'll check in with you and say, it's like, are you all right? Just go, go. All right, all right. And then she'll rush off and head over to the to the building where Laz was last seen. Uh, so this is an opportunity to do that assist thing. I think, Bello, you're moving in to kind of like help clear things as, as Laz is coming down. Uh, so I think this time uh, it is a little more about might to, you know, push through these things. Uh, uh, and survival. So, Laz, uh, 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 assuming that you're coming down, trying to to get out of here, uh, let's have you roll map might plus survive with two d twenty, and then Bello, you can roll one d twenty. Okay, doke. You are muted, Laz. All right, so here goes, here goes mine. Um, yeah, we'll see how this goes. Oh, two successes. Okay. Uh, uh, and then Bello, you roll yours. Okay. Uh, so what is your might? Ten. So Ten. Uh, <clears throat> you're able to kind of push, but uh, uh, to to get that last path. Uh, uh, you see Laz coming down, uh, uh, maybe firemen carrying this this wounded, and I think just as the two the two of them come through, and you kind of help them get through that doorway, this building just collapses in uh, uh, wood and flames and and embers here. Yeah, I think <clears throat> I think I pull you both out of the way in time before we get engulfed by the falling burning debris i think and uh yeah just checking to see if you're if you're both all right yeah i think you know laz, laz is coughing <laughs> right but, but gains uh gains his breath and uh looks back and says well that went pretty well didn't it <sighs> everyone's out right uh, yeah uh, of course I, I i i was i i was taking charge of it of course everybody's out okay i i assume you 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 uh you made mincemeat of uh of those uh fine three folk heading down the road i had some help and she looks over at woola <clears throat> and i think at this moment there's kind of a decision that needs to be made uh your group can stay here to like get people settled uh, to make sure that they're okay, treat wounds, catch your own breath, uh, uh, and maybe help them, you know, because they're not going to be able to stay here, head on to the, the nearest settlement. Uh, or you can immediately take off after this, this waker, and let's imagine that's the four of you together kind of like having a chance to 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 talk about what the next step is. Do we know that the waker worshippers, the thralls, would only follow the waker and not come back and kind of deal out some <clears throat> retribution on this settlement? I you think. Know? Given that they just sent the that that those three off, mm-hmm. that's clearly very much a secondary concern for them. Okay. So they'll they'll wait for them to show up, and when they don't show up, uh, they they probably won't come back to investigate. Then, in which case, uh, Bellu's vote is going to go for. We take care of this before they can come back or meet any other settlements in their path. 
and take care of this now. Well, what does that look like exactly, Bellu, taking care of this? We follow the Waker. And when these worshippers follow the Waker, we lie in wait for them. Um, there's a lot of people here who are hurt. They need to get someplace safe. They need to get someplace where they can get medical attention. I've done what I can for them right now. But look at this, look at this settlement. There's no, this is no place for a hospital. I can't set something up like that. There's going to be more strength in numbers. We need to get these people to the next settlement, or at least the next closest settlement. Do we know how close that is? <laughs> Out of character question. So, yeah, I think what you will see, in it, uh, uh, kind of to provide some context here, the nearest settlement is a place called New Moss Grove. It's on the river. It's a pretty big crossroads settlement. Uh, uh, and you know a, a fairly direct way there. Uh, the Waker's Path seems to be going along kind of the lines of the sort of the the flatter area it may well be heading to new Mosgrove, but it's taking a roundabout way it's following an old path there can new Mosgrove absorb the number of people in this village oh absolutely okay. <clears throat> let's make sure we wouldn't be creating a bigger problem by solving a smaller one. sure um you have a fair point. They need defense. If we can evacuate with them now, get them on the road, a straighter road to New Mosgrove, and we protect them on the way, then maybe we can meet the Waker afterward making sure everyone else here is safe. Laz, Hene? Well, do we know if there is anything <clears throat> directly in the path that the Waker was taking, like sort of a straight shot, an obvious destination that it might have? Based on... Well, actually, let's let's have you let's have you make a roll here. Let uh, uh, I'll give you some basic info, but but let's have you since this is sort of your uh, thing, let's have you roll insight plus study. So 10 slash three. Uh, all right. Boom. Eight and 11, that okay. is two successes. Uh, so you will know that it's kind of following an old road uh towards where new mossgrove is like you can tell that and you know this about machines is they tend to follow old paths which is why it's going so indirectly the only thing that's between there uh along that path is there is a set of uh older uh like an older bunker set of ruins that got uh, uh torn open uh, you know, maybe a couple of generations ago. Uh, so it will be going, it might be going there or it might be going just past that. Does that seem like a fair answer? Sure. Um, I think that Henny will sort of sketch that out, you know, in the dirt or whatever um, and and relay that information to everyone else um, and say, you know, I... I see some merit in using this opportunity to try to get to New Mosgrove before the Waker does so that we can warn them um, and perhaps, you know, get some of these now refugees to safety. Uh, I am a little concerned that if we travel with them, it may slow us too much to successfully warn New Mosgrove before the Waker gets there. Point two. <clears throat> Very well. Point, 
Yeah, I think Laz, I mean, he he's kind of like dusting off his his uh cloth, you know, cloak that kind of an armor that kind of got heavy clothing that got covered with ash. Uh but you know, Laz says, well, I'm 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 nothing worse for wear right now. I, I do not like the idea of leaving a waker to traipsy about the the countryside. Um I I I appreciate that these people um are in need of of healing, but my fear is that that waker is uh you know gonna leave. I think there's a lot more destruction possible in that waker wandering around. Um you know, I I I I I would vote for for following uh following behind to see what kind of uh other um unpleasantness that waker may be may be leaving and and possibly find a way to kind of stop this problem so out of character how do we all feel about splitting the party i was good, just going to suggest that as yeah. a gm uh, on a short tutorial adventure please do not split the party okay <laughs> Fair enough. Let me go we would normally here. split the party for sure, <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, uh, if you decide that you want to head on to new moss grove uh and try to alert them ahead of time we can essentially narrate that you get these people set so that they'll be safe for their travels on if you want to get ahead of them. Mm -hmm. Or you can do that, that same thing, but not warn New Moss Grove and instead try and head directly after this thing. I think that's the two sort of choices that you have. Yeah. I mean... if Go ahead. Uh, Please. My thought, well, Belu's thought would be that, you know, we can move much quicker as a small group and then we can just try and you know meet or cut off the the waker and then um you know just take care of it um as we go and then we'll set up these people before we leave to make it to new moss grove as best as they can and then you know give them the warning as they as they go along too but i mean i think yeah i mean she'd want to to go chase after the after the waker. Hene, Wula? I think obviously as a player, I'd go with whatever. <laughs> I, I think we are probably better equipped um, as, you know, sort of the knowledgeable uh, adventurous sorts that we are to handle this waker. And I feel like, um, as Belu said, if we give them, you know, as much uh, uh initial assistance as possible it shouldn't be difficult for these folks to make their way down known roads to new moss grove um we could potentially even slow down the waker uh, or distract it um giving them time to get there and provide the warning that's the way that i'm leading my thinking on it is that if we go to new moss grove and warn the people there, their safety in numbers will provide a much better defense to stop the waker. We'll have more people, we'll have more access to more weapons, and it will have a chance to actually entrench. So whatever the thralls and the waker intend to do, we can blunt it. I mean, Bellu is the tip of the spear, literally and figuratively. Like, this is the sort of thing that this is... Four of us following this thing through the wilderness, who knows what we'll be facing. At least with New Mosgrove, we have the advantage of being able to set up defenses, traps, prepare people. It does sound like we're leaning towards, when all is said and done amongst the four of you, that the, the general consensus is uh, to follow the waker to try and get and intercept it uh, and and do that does that seem like a fair reading from from uh of the table 
Okay. Uh, Awula, uh, when, when your companions kind of like they've leaned into that decision and, uh, you know, you're going to go with them. Is it, it do you like, uh, are you re uh, reluctant about that? Or once they've decided, do you go along with it? Like what's your, your, your reaction once that kind of decision is made? I'm a little reluctant and perhaps just the slightest bit annoyed because traveling with warriors, I thought that they might have more tactical sense than to just run off into the unknown, chasing the unknown. Um, but for my part, I'm also trying to figure out what I can do to get a message to New Mossgrove, even ahead of the refugees that we're sending there. Um how are you doing that? Uh, are you spending supply for some kind of communication thing? Are you trying to heal up one of the, the like healthier of these people to like go there as fast as they can? Yes, on foot? like a runner. Okay. Because one of the I think, things about the, yeah. go ahead. I, I think that's no problem. I think that's pretty easy for you to do. All right. Um, so I'll roll 2d20 or are you just going to let that happen? Uh and let's let's have you roll just because I, I i let let let's see you know you won't know exactly what what has come about but uh what do you think you want that want to roll that with to kind of get that set um i'm thinking resolve yeah because it's like okay fine i'm gonna go with the i'm gonna go with the party but this needs to be done and the other thing um Am I healing the runner up or am I prepping them for talking? I think to I think we're I think talking. So I think resolve talk feels good. Okay. Yeah. All right. So 2d20. Waiting for the roll. Oh yeah. Eight and a one. Three successes. You you give the speech to the youngest and fastest of them. You tell them how important it is. You put the fire in their eyes, uh, and they'll they'll nod along, and uh, they will immediately sprint off in the direction of New Boss Grove as as fast as their feet can carry them. Does that sound fair? Totally fair. Does that does that give any momentum for that the three success? Uh so you can add uh, uh, one momentum to the pool. So a quick question, mm -hmm. if we don't add that momentum to the pool, can that be added to the defense of New Mossgrove? Effectiveness of it? Yeah, you could spend it to be more effective in, in case that thing does get to New Mossgrove. All right. Is that a decision we can make next time? Well, you can just make that decision now uh, because it's you rolled it, your momentum. So you choose to either put the momentum in the pool or or add it to the effect. I have a question, uh, yes. just like a system question. Absolutely. Um, since there are now three momentum in the pool, could Puckett establish a truth here also and just say that New Moss Grove is in fact prepared for the Waker's arrival? Absolutely. Yeah, Ooh. you could take, you could spend the extra momentum uh, that you just got <laughs> plus one from the pool and that would mm -hmm. create that truth. Ooh, are we all okay with that? Absolutely. I love Heck that. Yeah, do it. Okay. Perfect. So question. Yes. So what happens to the two remaining points in the pool or are we using all of the points? Uh, the two points will sit there for the moment. Okay. We're going to tick it down by one at the end of this scene. Okay. Uh, but New Mosgrove is alerted. Uh, there is the, the people who are here will, will pull out like the, the, the goods and materials and things that they have. Uh, and if you look on the equipment tab, uh, on the character keeper, I've got a list of things, uh, and everyone may pick a piece of equipment that these settlement people will, will hand to you to assist you in this journey. Uh, so, uh, Laz which one would you take? Uh, 
Um, the bypass kit, maybe? That seems reasonable. Do, uh, what's your tech level for your character? My tech level is... Uh, is three. So, so, so the, the bypass kit is a little bit out of your... Oh, I see, yes. Yeah. Uh, all right, so... Um, There's some, uh, let's see. Uh, maybe the the security pulser. Okay. Absolutely. So you will grab grab a hold of that. Uh, Bellu, what do you want to take? Um, it looks like the only thing I can take with my tech value would be the crossbow or the first aid kit. Um. Shoot. Uh, la, la. <sighs> Question is, is she all about weapons or does she want to protect? Uh, yeah, let me do a uh, crossbow. I mean, yeah. I saw how, how it well. Gives like, you a, like, yeah, it gives you I a ranged well attack yeah. and it is quiet. So there is yeah. certain advantages to that. Cool. And then like I saw like how well uh Woola used it before, so why not? I'll get my own. Yay. <laughs> uh uh Woola, what would you take? Sorry about that. I had to get back to the zoom tab. Sure. Um just because these they seem hell bent on dragging me into a fight, I'm taking some light armor. Okay. Uh and then uh Hene. Uh, I think Henny will take the eyepiece. Okay. So that's where we're going to stop. We're going to take up. Yes. Uh, question. Could we, could we take one, like, since we're going to lose a, a momentum point anyway, at the end of this, mm -hmm. can we use that momentum point to say that the, the people from this settlement are, are, Secure enough to head to New Moss Grove, them like you know by themselves, like they don't. Need yeah, I feel I feel like yeah, burn that. Yeah, uh, uh, and and it, that feels right given the actions that you've done to establish that they are are safe. Establish that. Thank you. Uh, so we'll take up next time with the the journey to try and intercept the the path of this. We'll kind of you know do our little uh, travel obstacles uh narration uh and see where we catch up with them uh and you know uh figure out how you're going to deal with that situation does that seem cool awesome. yes works uh, for me awesome uh so i am uh we'll do stars and wishes at the end of the second session since this is just okay. a short thing uh i am going to stop the recording